Welcome to presentation number 15 in our series, Rereading Revelation. We are still in the section uh, describing the seven trumpets. We are in the intermission, the second half of the intermission between the sixth and the seventh trumpet. And our title for this is Message and Method. And the text is Revelation 11. <clears throat> now, in Revelation 10, we had message and mission. And the titles are carefully chosen. That is to say here, <clears throat> message and method. Here again, the seven trumpets from chapter 8, verse 2 to eleven nineteen. We did one, uh, one presentation on the first six trumpets from the point of view of exegesis, explaining the text. Then we did one on the trumpets and the quest for history, how these texts have been read and how they have been applied wisely and sometimes unwisely to specific historical events. And then last time, the intermission on chapter 10, uh, message and mission. And now message and method here in this and the uh, ending of it, the seventh trumpet, uh, the seventh trumpet like that. So this will be the ending of the trumpet sequence. Here again, the Bamberg apocalypse <clears throat> with the angels and the seven trumpets. And here one more time, the interpretation of these trumpets as expose of demonic activity, as we have seen in this perception and many more like it. This is the welcome apocalypse, demonic activity in the world <coughs> exposed. And just also by way of review, we have seen a progression as we have moved from the seven seals to the seven trumpets. In the intermission uh, between the sixth and the seventh seal, we saw an action of restraint, restraining the forces of evil in the intermission here. And <clears throat> we had an illustration for this, the angels restraining the forces. Here are the restraining angels so as to make possible the sealing of the believers. <clears throat> and then <clears throat> we saw uh, letting go of restraint in the intermission between the sixth and the seventh trumpet. I call that progression. Uh, and here we have <clears throat> an illustration of the destroying forces being released here uh, in, uh, at the end of the sixth, or as the sixth trumpet uh, happens. <clears throat> so, uh, my headline here, <laughs> restraint and letting go of restraint. That's what we are seeing. This will be very important when we get further down in the story to <clears throat> the seven bowls, the seven last plagues. And the setup here again, you can see how the pattern is the same, seven seals, first six, then the timeout, and then the seventh one, and the same in the trumpet sequence, seven, uh, six trumpets, the timeout, and the seventh one. And <clears throat> now we should be ready to start. Message and method. A, and a measuring rod, like a staff, was given to me with the instruction, get up and measure the temple of God and the altar and those who worship there. <clears throat> but the cart outside the temple, leave that out and do not measure it, because it has given, been given to the nations, and they will trample the holy city for 42 months. <laughs> Pretty dense text. Here is what the Deuce Apocalypse does with it. Here an, a measuring rod is given to, to John, and the instruction to measure the temple here and those who worship it, worship their here. And here is someone with a measuring tape. So measure, something you do in architecture, 
in a metaphorical sense, you might say measure is a kind of evaluation, a kind of assessment. Uh, and that could easily be the connotation here. <clears throat> and <clears throat> let's look at it again in this panoramic view in the, uh, in the Trinity Apocalypse. The measuring rod given by the angel to John with the instruction to measure the temple and those who worship there. Uh, pretty amazing, amazingly executed, uh, wouldn't you say? <clears throat> So there is a spatial dimension here, a, con a connotation of space. And space could mean place. It can also have a metaphorical uh, <clears throat> meaning. So let's look at the possibilities in this text. Categories, the categories first. Two categories, those who worship and those who trample. So there are two groups, those who worship and those who trample. And then there is a location, a kind of place or spatial uh, issue. Uh, those who worship are inside. Those who trample are outside. That's how it starts. And then we get from this concrete ways of seeing it to a reality, because here is re reality. Those who trample, they trample on those who worship. But if they trample on those who worship and those who worship are inside, then somehow the spatial boundaries break down because those who trample must also be coming inside. So you see, it doesn't quite, it is not so neatly, the lines are not so neatly demarcated. If I am correct to say that those who trample, trample on those who worship. And here another thing about reality then, God knows who is who. Aside from spatial separation, God knows who is who, and those who worship are protected, even though they are trampled. <clears throat> well, here is a, a p depiction of what, what, is, what is what here. So we have <clears throat> a, the big picture, and then we have details. At the center of the al is the altar, and the altar is inside the temple. That's where the worshippers are. The court and the rest is outside the temple. That's left for those who trample. This is the space for those who trample. This is the space for those who, who worship. But the lines of demarcation are in some ways blurred here because those who trample, trample on those who worship. So <clears throat> you have to look at this. <clears throat> I'm going, I'm, I'm continuing now. <clears throat> and <clears throat> so what about the Old Testament? Can the Old Testament help us here? The Old Testament can always help us when we read the book of Revelation. It never, ever fails. <clears throat> so here is a measuring scene from Ezekiel where there is a lot of it going on and we could go we could use several chapters from Ezekiel on it but we will just feature two texts <clears throat> starting in chapter 40 <clears throat> when he brought me there a man was there whose appearance shone like bronze with a linen cord and a measuring reed in his hand and he was standing in the gateway this is the temples the uh, temples setting he measured it, now jumping to chapter 42, he measured it on, four, on the four sides. It had a wall around it, 500 cubits long and 500 cubits wide, to make separation between the holy and the common. So there again you have measure, measuring as lines of demarcation, separation here between the holy and the common like the inside and the outside, just as we hinted at in, in Revelation. <clears throat> and then you have this one. <clears throat> this is Zechariah. And let's do the idea here to measure Jerusalem, to see the sort of size of the, the vision for the kingdom, the way God's work will, <clears throat> will progress or unfold. So... <clears throat> I looked up and saw a man with a measuring line in his hand. 
Then I asked, where are you going? He answered me, to measure Jerusalem, to see what is its width and what is its length. Then the angel who talked with me came forward, and another angel came forward to meet him and said to him, run, say to that young man, Jerusalem shall be inhabited like villages without walls, without lines of demarcation, because of the multitude of people and animals in it. For I will be a wall of fire all around it, says the Lord, and I will be the glory within it. So here we move from the realm of the concrete external to the realm of internal matters, walls that can be seen and walls that are real, but they cannot be seen. So these are strange conceptions. And of course, if we use this text and relate it to Revelation 11, the call to measure, and here the call not to measure, we <clears throat> have enough subject matter for thinking for a week or so. <clears throat> I will try to uh, <clears throat> tease out some points here. Space as metaphor. So measure and temple, if we look at them as meta metaphors, the referent is people and what people do in a spiritual conception. And here, <clears throat> just this one point in Zechariah, the incentive to measure is stopped and retracted because that incentive is predicated on a notion of space that is too small. Your conception of what God is up to is not big enough. So it's too small, don't measure. And it is also predicated on a notion of protection that quantifies what cannot be quantified. Maybe we could also say that it is predicated on a notion of quality and that humans, we are not in a position to assess quality. So we see here, <clears throat> altar, temple, court and city clearly demarcated. And then when we go to the, <clears throat> to the realm of metaphor, the lines of demarcation will blur. <clears throat> this is the Cambrai apocalypse and the same scene here, just one last time measuring the temple. <clears throat> I'm reading now further in Revelation 11. My two witnesses, <clears throat> and I will commission my two witnesses to proclaim an inspired revelation for 1,260 days dressed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two lampstands that stand before the Lord of the earth. And here in the Jews' apocalypse, we have the two witnesses here, and we have two lampstands, and we have some more details that we will, uh, will uh, 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 explain, but <coughs> two lampstands and two olive trees. Yes, that's what we have. And here, uh, uh, this is a a good representation of what is described. <clears throat> and yeah, uh, focusing on, on that detail here, the lampstand, which is a notion of witness and olive trees, also kind of a notion of witness. <clears throat> <clears throat> so again, what do we do? <laughs> well, I'm waiting for my invisible audience to speak back to me and to shout we go to the Old Testament. That's what we do. <clears throat> so we go to the Old Testament. We go to Zechariah one more time. He said to me, what do you see? <clears throat> I said, and I said, I see a lampstand all of gold with a bowl on the top of it. There are seven lamps on it, the seven, with seven lips on each of the lamps that are on the top of it. And by it are two olive trees, one on the right of the bowl and the other 
uh, on its left. So this is clearly a text that echoes in Revelation 11. There is no doubt about that. I said to the angel who talked with me, what are these, my Lord? Then the angel who talked with me answered me, and do you not know what these are? I mean, what's wrong with you? <laughs> I said, no, my Lord. <clears throat> he said to me, this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. We have as our title here, message and method. And here we have had it spelt out to us, the method, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit. Maybe we could say that is also the message, not by might, nor by power. That message and method are conflated here. <clears throat> so this is very clarifying, isn't it? Very amazing clarification. <clears throat> And just to think we had all fixed it out now, the not by might part, then the text <coughs> throws, a, throws a wrench into the machinery here and we will read on. And if anyone wants to harm them, fire goes from their mouth and consumes their enemies. If anyone wants to harm them in this manner, he must be killed. Now, I will mute this one immediately by saying that anything that goes out of the mouth when it comes to God's side has the connotation of witness, not violence. But it is a strong, strong uh, statement. These have authority to shut the heaven in order that no rain may fall during the days of their proclamation of the revelation. And they have authority over the waters to turn them into blood and to strike the earth with every kind of plague as often as they wish. We had the statement, not by might, not by power. And here there is a lot of might and a lot of power. And we have our illustration again here, the two witnesses and their fire coming from the mouth here. And then we had a couple of details. <clears throat> so the no rain figure is clearly modeled on Elijah when there was no rain in his day for three and a half years or whatever. And he shuts the heaven, there will be no rain. And <clears throat> the other figure who turns water into blood, that is clearly modeled on Moses. So we have the two witnesses modeled on Moses and Elijah. Now we have figured that out. But we have a description of what they do. And how does that work in the context of, of, uh, of Revelation? So the Trinity Apocalypse shows us here the two witnesses that are, have a mandate from God. And here uh, this one that would be Moses then turning water into blood. So these are <clears throat> masculine witnesses, as it were, uh, <clears throat> very, <laughs> and the notion of violence is, is almost seems to be implied. So let's look again at this fire and blood now as hyperbole and reality. And I have explained hyperbole earlier by saying that hyperbole is an intentional exaggeration. <laughs> And everyone understands that it is an exaggeration. That's the character of hyperbole. Moses, the plagues on Egypt, turning water into blood. <clears throat> Here is Moses' uh, CV, his, <clears throat> his um, curriculum vitae, turning water into blood, yes. Plagues, yes. And then in the end in Revelation, the legacy of Moses. The song of Moses in Revelation 15 is also the song sung by the Lamb. So the legacy of Moses aligns with Jesus. They sing from the same song sheet. And the legacy of Jesus is as the Lamb that was killed with violence. So you have to take the notion of turning water into blood and plagues 
with a grain of salt. Let's look at Elijah. There is in some ways a conversion of meaning in these images. Here is Elijah. He is on Mount Carmel. This is Lucas Cranach, the younger, who depicts this, the fire that comes down from heaven. So let's see what Elijah does. There was no rain first. Then there is fire from heaven. Easy. But then in the Old Testament, after this, Elijah got, gets completely discouraged. He doesn't, he, lo he loses in some ways faith in what has happened here. He goes to Mount Horeb, the same place where Moses had a revelation of God <coughs> earlier. He goes on that path back to that cave and has an encounter with God when God is not in the fire. So there is a transitioning, a maturing, a changing of perspective inside the story of Elijah when it comes to his legacy. And then in the book of Revelation, who gets makes fire come down from heaven? Not the true prophet. It is the false prophet that makes fire come down from heaven. In, uh, in Revelation. So here, when we hear these terms, fire and blood and all those things, we must not rush to conclusions. <clears throat> I will propose the following for these three images we have had so far. When we have the image of measuring the temple and then finding an Old Testament text that says not to measure what is too big for measuring, and not suitable for human measures. We're talking about spiritual realities. We have the second one, turning water into blood like Moses, and then seeing that the evil forces in Revelation turn water into blood. While Moses sings the same song as the Lamb. Again, let's not rush to conclusions. We have fire from heaven like Elijah, and then reading that the evil side makes fire come down from heaven in Revelation. Here is how I want to adjudicate this. The witnesses have the same mandate. They have the mandate of Moses and Elijah, but not the method. The method is the method of the Lamb. That's the, uh, the thing here. But it pushes us to examine the premises and to look beyond surface appearances in the text. And these are our illustrations here, the measuring of the temple here, and uh, the image of the two witnesses here and what they do, and now what they don't do. <clears throat> we are reading now on in Revelation. And when they, the two witnesses, <clears throat> bring their testimony to completion, the beast that comes up from the bottomless pit will make war on them and win over them and kill them. Well, what is this? We heard earlier that the two witnesses, they have the mandate and they can do anything and they can kill their, their enemies at any, at any point. But here the witnesses are killed. Someone is making war on them. And <clears throat> our illustration here, uh, uh, here they are, the witnesses have been killed. Here they are now dead. Uh, and the world looks at that and thinks it's a, not, that was a good idea. <clears throat> and then we are told that it is the beast that comes up from the bottomless pit that makes war on them and kills them. And the bottomless pit has been defined in our trumpet sequence in the fifth trumpet. The star that came down from heaven had the key to the bottomless pit. That's the domain of that star. And the Trinity Apocalypse makes it easier for, no, for us to know who it is. Here is the, the, the phenomenon in the fifth trumpet. And here is the beast that came up from the bottomless pit. It's the same figure. It is the evil one himself. That's uh, unambiguous. The connection here is un unambiguous. 
And their dead body, there are two bodies, but there is a singular, the word is in singular here, and their dead body will lie in the street of the great city, the one that is called spiritually, that is spiritually called Sodom and Egypt where also their Lord was crucified. Now, Sodom and Egypt are the antagonists of God. They sort of, they, they sort of exhibit one and two when it comes to opposition to God. Uh, so that's one image. But it also says that they were lying and buried in the street where also their Lord was crucified. And the Lord was not crucified in Sodom and Egypt. He was crucified in Jerusalem. So here again, we have challenging conceptions, lines of demarcation that simply blur and in some ways dissolve. And they, <clears throat> and they from the peoples and tribes and languages and nations shall gaze at their body for three and a half days. And they refuse to let the dead bodies be placed in a tomb. This is the epitome of dishonor and disrespect. In the Middle East, even today, you die and you get buried immediately. Same day burials are the name of, uh, are, is the sort of cultural norm. Or bury not a week later. Here they lie exposed in a state of utter dishonor uh, for three and a half days. <clears throat> so, here we see <coughs> see that again that they are uh, there they lie exposed and we read in the text that they uh, uh, let's see let's read in the text and the inhabitants of the earth will rejoice over them and be delighted and exchange presents with each other because of these two prof because these two prophets had exasperated the inhabitants of the earth. They had been a nuisance. Now they are rid of them. And here you can see they visit each other, they exchange gifts, they play the violin and they blow the horn of the trumpet here and it says, and they play the harp. So this is a sign of, uh, this is a scene of celebration over the death and now uh, the sort of humiliation of the two witnesses. <clears throat> And after the three and a half days, the breath of life from God entered into them, and they stood on their feet, and all fell on those who saw them. And they, the two witnesses, heard, or who, who hears it, everyone hears it, but I think it's mostly the two witnesses, and they heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, Come up here. And they went up to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies saw them. So here, from being in the street unburied, here God blows the breath of life into their mouths again. So they become alive, they stand on their feet, and they go up to heaven. And the world sees it and takes note of what is happening here. There is, a, this is a scene of resurrection and ascension, very clearly. And then there is a statement of impact, the impact of the death, resurrection, and ascension of the two witnesses. And at that hour, there was an er a great, great earthquake, and a tenth of the city fell, and 7,000 people were killed by the earthquake, and the rest were in awe, and spoke well of the God of heaven. That is what the text says. I am not making this up. So the impact factor here is huge because the rest the, were in awe and spoke well of the God of heaven seems to mean a change of view, a change of opinion from being hostile to becoming friendly. That it has had a transformative impact. I call that the impact of the death, resurrection and ascension of the two witnesses. And the Cambrai Apocalypse gives us this scene in the trumpet sequence here, and then the, a scene of uh, worship, a scene of adoration, as it were. Now, 
one more thing about this, and now to <clears throat> from within the book of Revelation itself. Here we are in Revelation chapter 14, and we have a message of three angels that are flying in mid-heaven with an eternal good message to those who live on the earth. And we will get to that in a few <coughs> presentations from now. Uh, but here is the first angel. The first angel comes and he has a message. And let's read what, what the angel says. And I saw another angel flying in mid-heaven with an eternally valid good message to proclaim to those who live on the earth, to every nation and uh, tribe and language and people, saying in a loud voice, be in awe of God and speak well of him. For his hour has come, the critical moment, and worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water. And in the trumpet sequence, we have seen a figure that destroys the sea, the earth, and the springs of water. And here is a contrast between him who created it and who, uh, who maintains or preserves them. So and this <coughs> word by the angel here is very similar to what happens here. The angel proclaims it in Revelation 14, and here it happens. What the angel calls for to happen on the earth actually happens here. The rest were in awe and spoke well of the God of heaven. So let's just get this straight. <clears throat> there is an impact here. It is not like what God does has no impact on the world. Here it has the impact that the rest were in awe and spoke well of the God of heaven. And that fits with the message proclaimed here what the first angel calls on the world to do actually happens. It's not like you say it and nothing happened. Be in awe of God and speak well of him. And the book of Revelation gives us all kinds of reasons to speak well of God. So <clears throat> here <clears throat> we have that scene then, the scene of the world turning to in 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 response to the message <clears throat> so let's just <clears throat> summarize what we have seen in the time out so far in the time out in chapter 10 and 11 the time out part 1 in chapter 10 puts the mystery of god at the center the mystery announced in ages past to nebuchadnezzar and to daniel instructing the believing community to tell that story again and to tell it better. <clears throat> That's part one. Uh, and we had that here in uh, Endurer's depiction, the angel that came down with an open scroll, Daniel eating the scroll and then called to mission again to, to tell the story again. The timeout part two in chapter 11 puts the same message at the center, but the but this mystery is now embodied in the two witnesses. <clears throat> so timeout, mission and message, mission and method here. <clears throat> so a story that features the violent death, non-burial resurrection and ascension of the two witnesses is nothing if not a recapitulation of the story of the lamb that was killed with violence. It's that same story, but now embodied in the story of the two witnesses. Don't we see that here? We see them uh, killed, the witnesses killed. Here they are dead, and then uh, they are resurrected here resurrected and stand on their feet, and here they ascend up to God. And that's the story of Jesus, but it is the story told in the story of the two witnesses. The witness of the two witnesses is the witness of embodiment. 
it's not just what you say. It is a story that is recapitulated as embodiment. And the embodiment of that story, this is the connection between message and method. It's not the story of the Christian church, where the Christian church might tell the story of Jesus and live a story quite different, a hegemonial story, a story of power and oppression and persecution and whatnot. So the story of embodiment here, and this again, seeing it in these uh, illustrations. <clears throat> Just as the spatial frame of reference is cosmic, not local, so the temporal frame of reference for the death and resurrection of the witnesses cannot be pinpointed to a specific event on time. This is, so you could say, well, what, at what point in history did those witnesses get killed? And you can find points in history that may fit you or fit that scheme. But I don't think that works for the imagery in Revelation. It is timeless. This is the character of the true witness at all times throughout history. <clears throat> and one more point. The city called Sodom and Egypt is neither Sodom nor Egypt. It is the city where their Lord was crucified. It is not the city bereft of religion, the secular city. It is the city of religion. So again, I take issue with some <coughs> commonly held views here that this happens in a spe special period of time is too narrow and that it happens in the secular city is misguided because they are crucified in the city where the Lord was also crucified. So <clears throat> it's not as simple as one may have thought. Okay, <clears throat> the beast that comes from the abyss is the star that fell from heaven. The frame of reference again is cosmic rather than local. There are always all kinds of ways to shrink the, or to change the identity of this figure, but is the evil one himself. <clears throat> and <clears throat> number eight, the embodied witness of the two witnesses leads to the conversion of the nations. The nations that did not turn and did not repent at the end of the sixth trumpet, now they turn because of the embodied witness of the two witnesses. The recapitulation of the story. The, the lamb that was killed with violence. <clears throat> and here they have turned. <clears throat> there is one little thing left. <clears throat> then the seventh angel blew his trumpet, and there were loud voices in heaven saying, the kingdom of this world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Messiah, and he will reign forever and ever. Then the 24 elders <coughs> who sit on their thrones before God fell on their faces and worshipped God, singing, We give you thanks, Lord God Almighty, who are and who were, for you have taken your great power and reigned. And here I wish to make a few points. <coughs> so we are back in the heavenly, in the setting of the heavenly council. In fact, we have never left it. We have been there all the time. Everything we have read between the going up to heaven in chapter 4 and what happens here, all of this happens in the setting of the heavenly council. And at the center of attention in the heavenly council is the lamb that has been killed with violence. That has not changed. This is sort of a fixture now in this uh, uh, scenery. And here is a little uh, conundrum in the translation, because I have translated it a little different than the standard. For you have taken your great power and reigned. <clears throat> so some people say that this verb here, the verb for, for reigning, <clears throat> that that is in what is called in Greek an ingressive aorist. So the translation would be, you have taken your great 
power and begun to reign. But my translation changes that a bit. God has reigned all the time. It isn't like, you know, oh, I didn't reign, I was absent. God never was absent. God has reigned all along. This is how God reigns. That's the idea here. You have taken your power and reigned. And the word here for taken, you have taken, is the same word that the Revelation uses when it says about the figure who was slain with violence, that he went and took the scroll. You have taken it. That is so the notion of, uh, of a sort of absence of God and now God is present is must not be overstated here. <clears throat> so <clears throat> let's read on. The nations were enraged, but your wrath has come and the time for judging the dead, for rewarding your servants, the prophets and saints and all who fear your name, both small and great, and to destroy utterly those who destroy the earth. So here you can see that I have put some Greek words in, in, in uh, the brackets here. The nations were enraged. The word is <coughs> orgizo, or it, it's a word of the, the wrath, that's the verb. And then your wrath, he orge, su. So the same word orge here, and this is the verbal counterpart. The nations were angry, now God seems to be angry too. What's the relation between the anger of the nations and the, and the anger of God? We will, that, I want to bring that to your attention. And then here, and to destroy utterly those who destroy uh, the earth. And we will look at that in, in some, uh, just a retrospect. Here in the second trumpet, someone destroys the earth. The second angel blew his trumpet and something like a great mountain burning with fire was thrown into the sea. A third of the sea became blood, a third of the living creatures in the sea died, and a third of the ships were destroyed. The word here, that word doesn't occur frequently in Revelation, it occurs here. So the ones who are destroyed or whose destruction is predicted here, are the ones who are destroying the earth here, which we have said is a demonic reality. And then we can, so here is the uh, Angé apocalypse with the burning mountain coming down and destroying here, as we have seen before. And then the Old Testament background text. I am, this is in Jeremiah, uh, I am against you, O destroying mountain that destroys the whole earth. I will stretch out my hand against you and roll you down from the crags and make you a burned out mountain. So what I wish to uh, emphasize here is similarities of language. And again, this is a depiction of the mountain that is a but like a ball of fire in the second trumpet. And it is predicted that it will be destroyed. And the language is the same, the aftero. There you can see the verb here, the afteri, the afterontas, there, destroying. Here, the afteris, uh, the afterisan, here, same word. And sure enough, in the Septuagint, in the Old Testament, the same word, uh, the ephtharmenon and the ephtheron. These are important details. <clears throat> we will need every one of them when we do our summary. So this is like a retrospect and a preview. And <clears throat> we have these elements. The lamb won the war as a victim of violence. That stands firm not as a perpetrator of violence, but as a victim of violence. The lamb in the middle of the throne, still at the center in these scenes, is not only the promise that God will rule, but a revelation of how God rules. And 
two questions to be explored in future presentations. What is the relationship between the wrath of the nations and the wrath of God? It's the same word. Is wrath have the same meaning when God is the subject? That is a question we will explore. The destroyers of the earth will be destroyed. How? Still to come. <clears throat> the seventh trumpet. Then God's temple in heaven was opened, and the ark of his covenant was seen within his temple. And there were flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder, an earthquake, and heavy hail. And the Deuce Apocalypse gives us this op scene in the seventh trumpet. The, are, the heaven is opened again. The word open is a common word in the book of Revelation. The Ark of the Covenant is seen in the temple. And these this choreography, flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder, and an earthquake and heavy hail, are accompaniments of scenes of revelation, revelatory scenes. The scene of Mount Sinai, when God made an appearance. We are still reading a book of revelation, a book of revelations, and we are not done yet.